Hello everyone, um, welcome to episode 27 of Stuart Soundbites. Um, this is another really special episode today and I'm absolutely delighted by Jason Richards today. Hello Jason. Hi, good morning. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. We say good morning and it is morning for us because we're pre-recording this, so it's nine o'clock in the morning at the minute. Of course, everyone watching will see it at one o'clock, um, but it is pre-recorded, so as usual, um, we won't be able to answer any questions for you, unfortunately. But if you do have questions after the session, just send me an email um, and I can speak to Jason and we can we can come back to, um, to any questions with some responses. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, we, we, we've talked um, quite a lot uh, chats and um, Jason works at the minute for a consultancy and um, it's linked to construction and building services. And you actually, you know, one of our partners, Ben Townsend, and we'll, we'll, do, come, yeah. to, we'll come to this later. This is how we got in touch, Jason. But um, Jason uh, is a dad to twins. And Ben, as we know, has triplets. And you met at kind of a parenting uh, club for multiple. So that's how we got in touch initially. But um, Jason um, has a spinal cord injury. Um, Jason is a wheelchair user, and you're 25 years on from your accident now, um, Jason. 25 this year, yes. 25. So you had your accident. What age were you, Jason, when you had your accident? Um, I think I just literally turned 26. 26. Yeah. So yes, 25, and I think. 26. And I think you said to me when we spoke initially. Um, kind of having this conversation and doing this chat is kind of a nice way to mark almost half of your life I suppose as a wheelchair user. I think this year is kind of like the turning point because I, it'll, I'll be 50 and half my life will have been in a wheelchair so uh, it, it is quite a kind of significant year really for me I guess. Yeah and it's been an absolutely mental year for all of us um, and I thought what was really interesting, what came from our initial conversation was some of the challenges um, that lockdown has presented for you specifically as a wheelchair user. But again, we'll come back to that because I'm getting ahead of myself. So I wanted to start off um, by asking you if you don't mind just to tell us a little bit about um, your accident and your injury, um, Jason. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, as I say, I was 25, just just turning 26. Um, it was a Friday night um, and I went out with two friends on our motorbikes. So the plan was to just go out through the Yorkshire Dales and then come home back to Harrogate, uh, get ready and go for a night out. Um, I never made it back that, that night, um, just going into a corner into Grassington. Um, the bike skidded and then high sided, which is in effect, it, it flicked me up, it tossed me in the air, landed on my head. Um, and that compressed my spine and then between T5 and T8, so in the region of the chest, um, the, the, the vertebrae shattered and, and, and it was a complete spinal injury. And you, because um, obviously I'm a solicitor, I represent people that um, have sustained catastrophic injuries and bringing claims. Um, and most of the people that will be watching this webinar, Jason, will be involved in litigation in some way um, or will have experience of it. And but that, it, that wasn't the case for you. You didn't you didn't have a compensation claim. So that's, you know, that's entirely different. Yeah, um, I suppose uh, a law firm did look into it. Um, but there was there was no claim to take forward. There was some oil on the road, but um, you would have had to have located the vehicle that, that had deposited it. And the yeah. road signs were questionable and did get altered afterwards. But yeah, there was there was no compensation uh, paid out. I think at the time they'd kind of said it, it could be kind of record numbers if it was successful, just due to where I was in my career and kind of um, you know the future that that would have set before me, I guess. Yeah, and in that way, it's different for us to um, to think because you know you didn't have interim payments to kind of um, do any kind of particular rehab specialist rehab that you wanted to do. You had to cope with kind of community services and what what um, you were able to access on the NHS. So, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, sports because I know that sports was massive for you and yeah. um, it was a huge part of your rehab. And I'm interested to hear a little bit more about 
what your aspirations were before your injury and, and how you were able to kind of develop your sporting career afterwards? I suppose I'd always done sport, you know, even as a kid and enjoyed sport, but never particularly being brilliant at any one thing. I was kind of reasonably okay at lots of different sports. And we had a little group at work that did running and triathlon. And so, um, you know, we got to not a, not a particularly good level, but we just enjoyed it. And we liked the challenge and we liked going and doing it. And, um, you know, we used to run and, and do the triathlons. And so sport had always been part of my life. I didn't realise how it maybe it saved me as well or how it was going to save me. Mm -hmm. So um, I was laid in the hospital bed um, for seven weeks on bed rest. It was pretty much before they kind of rotted you, got you up and, and, and back to rehab straight away. So there was like, I lost m most of the muscle in my body, um, lost loads of weight. Um, and the, literally, the, but the day, someone brought like a bench press over the bed and it was like, right, you can actually do something. That was like a massive step forward in that suddenly I could do some exercise and start yeah. to move forward instead of kind of being stuck. Yeah. Um, one of my best friends from school, who's now a consultant at the hospital, came in and she was sort of crying at the bedside and she said, well, you know, Jason, what are you going to do now? And um, I think in her head she meant, you know, what are you going to do for work? Where are you going to live? How are you going to survive? And uh, I just said, I'm going to do the London Marathon. And she just looked at me as if I was a complete idiot. But I'd figured all the other stuff out. I'd had six weeks laying there to think about all of that. You know, I, those were things that I had to sort out to survive. But yeah. I was, I decided that the, mar the marathon was what, what I was going to do. Oh my goodness. And you're, you're being so modest about this as well, Jason, because you went on from, from the hospital and from those early stages of thinking about the marathon, of um, doing your bench press and realizing that you could, you could manage some exercise actually to do and amazing things in sport yeah I guess I, 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 I suppose uh, I never quite got to the level or achieved kind of the things that I maybe wanted to in sport but I got quite close and along the way so uh, yeah um, you know I, I, I broke some British records both in track and field and went to the world championships for triathlon and for uh, wheelchair racing so um, it, it was certainly something that was pretty amazing and that I really enjoyed. Yeah, it was a good time. Yeah, for sure. And uh, obviously things changed for you then, Jason. I think it was you had more than 10 years doing sport and kind of focusing on sport. Um, and we had a, a conversation about how that world of traveling and, you know, what was accessible to you and the people and uh, how that kind of changed for you when you had your twins who are now 13 yeah so, I think oh go on sorry no 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 I was just gonna I was just gonna ask you how how things changed when the kids came along yeah. and how your world kind of shifted I think when I was in in dis disability sport it was a world of can do there mm. were political barriers but there weren't physical barriers in sport so uh you, you know there was a classification system that that makes it more fair and puts you against people with similar disabilities yeah. um but but everything was accessible and it was things that i could do suddenly then becoming a father of twins you were faced with well I, how do i do this can i do this well no there are some things i can't physically do but what's what's the way around it what's the you know, how am I going to cope? How am I going to? And, and all of a sudden, when I went to work on a Monday morning, people didn't say, oh, where have you been this weekend? Oh, you were racing in Switzerland. Did you win? Oh, yeah, I broke a British record. Wow, that's amazing. You were overcoming adversity. You know, if I'd gone on and, and won a, a medal at, at, at that world level, then somebody would have given me, the Queen would have given me an honour or, a, you know, whereas when I'd just been a father, which with a disability was a thousand, I don't know, a million times harder. Nobody asked me on a Monday morning, ah, oh, what have you been doing this weekend? Because I'm just surviving the same yeah. as them. You know, suddenly my weekends weren't exciting 
for people to talk about. And yet I wanted to talk about it more. Yeah. I, you know, you said earlier, oh, you're quite modest about sport, but I was just doing something I loved. I didn't, I wasn't as keen to talk about it, but sometimes I just wanted to say, God, do you know what? It was really, really tough this weekend or, and, but I didn't get that opportunity. Mm. And did you feel like there was a lack? Maybe it's because um, you had, you, there have been so many years since your accident, you'd kind of adapt, you'd done all these great things and you'd adapted and people saw you as a really kind of resilient sportsman and thought, G you know, Jason knows what he's doing and he's really stable and he's great. And th did you feel that it was more kind of, apathy and people didn't didn't think ask you how yes. you were so it presumed that you were okay and coping almost in adopting a positive attitude and you know that can do and overcoming all of these things and finding ways to do so much it almost shot me in the foot because yeah. then people don't think you're going to need any help or that there's a vulnerability or that there's perhaps like some stuff that you've just swept under the carpet to do with becoming disabled, you know, and got on with it. But actually, suddenly being a father maybe lifted the corner of the carpet and some of those things started to come out that I had to start to deal with. Um, and then that was hard. And people just think you will carry on as you've always carried on in a really positive, you know, can do way. And did you feel, um, Jason, that you were able to say to anybody in particular, I, uh, you know, I need, I need a bit of help? Or did you kind of think, did you feel like, well, people should be asking me how I'm doing and I yeah. should, should, should know that I need a bit of help? Because it's interesting because I'm asking this because I work in, in a world where injury is um, new and acute and we're in you know we deal with a claim from usually very on after the early on after the accident to maybe yes. a couple of years later and we see all the time this very acute phase and everyone is very focused upon an injured individual and rehab and support and you know all of that stuff but you're much further on down the line do you think that there's something is there something missing do, do you know it's um when obviously I had friends at the time I was in hospital with who were going through claims and I couldn't understand how well they're thinking about what you might need in 25 years time or 30 years time how how can how does that factor in do you know what now 25 years later I, I totally understand and if anything yeah. I locked down and kind of the last year I, I've almost needed more help with my mental health than ever in like the you know in the past 25 years all those early years were kind of I accepted things more easily and just got on with it and I was I guess I was lucky in that I was young enough to have all of the energy to do that um but it's funny yeah I think you say it's new but it's always new there's yeah. always something new. There's always something ch that's changed. Even though mine's a complete injury, things still change and adapt and you age differently. And so, uh, yeah, I don't think it's a process that just stops once you once your compensation claims in the bank, for sure. Yeah. And that was something that I wanted to ask you about as well, um, because... We, as I say, we deal with the acute a lot of the time. So I'm wondering whether... Or injury are you still are you still learning things are you still discovering things about your injury and your capabilities and you know it's because I think when we first taught you said to me every day is a school day and that really struck me yeah I think um so I, I I guess I'm still learning things about my body and lockdowns almost focused it a bit more because you're just in the same place and like similar things are happening and I, I've learned certain things I had a few weeks ago where my hands were in so much pain that I physically couldn't put my own socks on. We, we don't know what it was. Um, we, we're not quite, it lasted about 10 days. We're not sure if it was a reaction to the COVID vaccination or it was an allergic reaction. But all of a sudden, I felt so much more disabled than I'd ever felt in 25 years. 
and it was something that was really difficult to to comprehend and to get my head around and yet you know I had to kind of go do you know what some of my like really good friends are quadriplegic they've, ne they've never had the benefit of their hands and yeah. suddenly it's like you know don't underestimate how they've survived all these years um and it, it kind of brings it home a little bit yeah and do you have any kind of tips I suppose for people watching that are either injured themselves or cares for injured people or working alongside injured people and you know in in terms of what we've just discussed I suppose in that kind of continuing role of support I think um what what I've seen and I remember my mum kind of like told me this years later but when I was in hospital the spinal injuries consultant had said to my mum be ready for a rough ride all the anger all the frustration will be taken out on the people that are closest to 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 your son to the injured person and I think uh you know that did happen and also what I saw was my brother couldn't cope with it at all he couldn't comprehend that his big brother suddenly you know needed some help and some support and he needed to then step up into kind of that role for a while and uh I think what's sometimes forgotten is what all those people around you were going through yeah um I, I almost didn't have any choice it was sink or swim and like get on with it I chose to, to swim at the time and you know and get on with it uh whereas those people didn't have to make an instant decision some of those people put off making that decision for several years about how they felt about what they needed so I think there's a real support network and I guess if there was one tip um I remember at one point just ringing up the spinal injuries unit at Pinderfield who were like amazing and kind of look after you for life mm -hmm. uh and and just saying I, I just need to come and talk to someone and I went and spoke to the clinical psychologist and um and she was an amazing lady and I just remember she said Jason it's about effort and reward so sometimes you need to weigh up that it's gonna take so much effort but what's the reward at the end of it she said if your twins are upstairs in a playroom and you've got to get out of your chair and go up the stairs on your bum and you know it's not easy but you can do it is the reward at the end of it worth it and if the answer is yes then get on with it and do it and if the answer is no then you need to reserve that effort for something that is worth that's so um striking jason and i think that that's kind of um universally applicable um which makes it one of the most helpful tips that i've ever heard <laughs> um and I, before before we go because as always i'm running on time i all and I, I i mean i never am able to stick to the time but that's because i've got such great guests so technically you're to blame but to ask you before you go a, a wee bit about lockdown because lockdown has presented I mean we could do a whole session on this um, a myriad of yeah. challenges for all sorts of different yeah. people for all sorts of different reasons but I want to talk about your reasons and I want to talk about your specific um circumstances and kind of what you've found um as as a wheelchair user as an injured person as a dad as a full-time worker as an absolute all-round frantically busy person how have you found um that you've have you have you been able to carve out any time for yourself are you still learning how to do that are you you know how, what, what have been the challenges for you uh it's been the toughest out of 25 years of disability it's been the toughest year so um without a shadow of a doubt um the I've always been like a lot of my friends in wheelchairs we you escape kind of normality through wheelchair sport through going to work through things that allow you to feel good about yourself that you can do and then I was surrounded by things I couldn't do I, I wanted to touch up the ceiling where a light was relocated I couldn't do it I saw all these jobs around me that maybe I'd been leaving and maybe I should knuckle down and do that were really, really physically difficult in a wheelchair um, or just couldn't be done at all. And so uh, it was really tough mentally and made me feel more disabled than I've probably ever felt. And um, some of those are just 
tackled head on and got them done. And that, do you know what? That felt amazing. Some of them I thought, right, uh, I need to organise this to be done. I will, rather than, you know, make it, I will make it happen. Um, uh, and then uh, at one point, um, there was a, a short period of furlough for me from my career. And uh, every day our little boy would sit on my knee and we'd walk about, I say walk, but I'd wheel about uh, probably two miles and we'd be out for an hour and a half and we'd just talk about things. And, you know, we'd just look at buses and plants and smell lavender and uh, on the route and we'd pick flowers and bring them home. And, and do you know what? That, that was like at such a peaceful time yeah. such a time that I needed uh, in amongst all of that the rest of the time has just been frantic trying to work from home balance children homeschooling little ones you know yeah. and the disability where suddenly you know you need an extra hour a day to do all the things that, that go with being disabled um, yeah. you know there's been some dark moments I remember one day going out on that walk I just put my headphones on with some music I listened to the same song about I don't know 30 times on this walk and, the, and the, our little boy was on my knee and I didn't I, I didn't even really speak to him but I just needed something to get me through that day because I just felt so kind of low with it and was struggling so much so and you know that's seeing all the people on tv with all the time on their hands who are creating art and doing amazing things but there's like so many unsung heroes with disability that are just getting through a normal day every day. Yeah. And it's so hard to, and, and yet they're not celebrated in the same way as an athlete or someone that's won a gold medal. And you know what? Sometimes winning those gold medals is easier than the, the stuff you've gone through to get there. Yeah. Um, or than when you've finished your career and you go back to everyday life and you've got to just do those normal things that are so much harder. Yeah. It's, um, it's an absolute pleasure, Jason, to have you. And it's um, a really powerful message, I think, that you've left us with. And it's a wonderful reminder, actually, for um, people watching that um, work and support and care for for others and um, for other injured people that might be watching to um, to check in and to make sure um, that people are doing okay and to ask and not presume and to recognize that um, sometimes things don't get easier. Um, we talked a lot, I should say, we, well, first of all, I should say that you have, you do have twins, but you also have a little boy who's just turned yeah, two yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't, I can't even begin, I've got one two-year-old and that is it, oh my goodness, that is enough. And um, I, I, I know that you're really stretched for time, uh, Jason, and I'm, I'm extremely, extremely grateful to you for, for chatting to me today. Um, and we talked a little bit before we started recording and the first time that we spoke about um, what we were going to title this session. Um, and I hope I hope you don't mind me saying that um, that you'd, you'd written a piece and it was called From Hero to Zero. So and we talked a little bit about how we would title this session and we agreed that maybe it would be from zero to hero and working our way back to hero again and reminding people about carving time out for themselves whether that's going out to look at the buses and the plants all the vehicles on the road which I have to recount every day with my two-year-old um and to make that time yeah. I think uh I think just just making and it doesn't need to be long but yeah. just 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 trying to find those few minutes to just do something that kind of makes you feel good or you know you maybe just it might just be to do nothing yeah. but it might just be to sit it might just be to enjoy I kind of love coffee but I, I don't I'm always just bolting it down and it it was funny I was speaking to another really good friend who, uh, uh, who, who used to be a teacher and now who writes um, for a living and uh, he's a coffee fan and he said I've stopped loving coffee Jason I've just started drinking it to get through the day and I'm drinking too much coffee and 
you know, because he works a lot in the States and they're on a different time zone. So he's off late, but then he gets off with the children. And uh, so one of the things was, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to take just when I make that coffee, I'm going to have five or 10 minutes. I'm going to remember what it tastes like. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and in doing that, I, and, and I'm trying to, to, to get back to exercise because I know how important it is. And, and I think maybe 25 years of longevity with a disability, a lot of the success of that is down to staying healthy and, you know, relatively fit. I'm not at my fittest, you know, I'm not as an, an athlete. The long gender and the healthy kind of mindset comes from keeping my body healthy, yeah. you know, my weight in check and all of those things has, has made disability easier to cope with. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Jason. I, I could talk to you all day, um, but uh, we're out of time um, and I have really enjoyed our chat and I'm very grateful to you. Um, and um, maybe we can persuade you to come back again in the future and let us know how you're getting oh, on. Yeah. See, see if I've bulged my way to slightly to more back to hero. Yeah, we'll call the next one back to hero. Yeah, sure. okay. <laughs> yes, and I'll speak to you soon. You take care. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.